Um, so I'm going to talk today just about um, some of the myths, as I said, related to um, smoking and mental health, and actually addressing smoking within mental health um, as a care issue for patients. The first slide, um, now I've taken this from a particular paper, but I could have taken this from a number of different research papers. And this was a paper looking at the mortality among those who suffer with chronic mental health problems. In the study in question was from the United States, but the figures hold up fairly comfortably for studies found in other parts of the developed world. And it shows that patients who suffer with mental health diagnosis, um, is that the pointer? No, that is the pointer. Um, basically had a significantly lower life expectancies as those that didn't have a mental health diagnosis during the duration of the study. Um, and there was roughly 16,000 people included in this study. Um, the number of life years lost during the course of the study was 11. So you can see during the, this particular study that they found that those suffering chronic mental health disorder had a six year less life lost. The important part about this study at the bottom, however, was the unnatural cause of death. And the expectation that people with chronic mental illness die earlier than everybody else, but of course they do, that's because they commit suicide, they get involved in accidents, they are more likely to be involved in violence and trauma. Um, but the statistics don't hold that out. That in fact, actually, the reasons why people with chronic mental health die earlier than those who don't have chronic mental health problems is actually largely due to physical health problems. So uh, the main reason, as I say, I put this study up is that the very last figure there, which is the unnatural cause of death, was actually not particularly significantly different between the two groups, which shows that why then are people with mental health problems dying earlier than people who don't have mental health problems, given that the fact that it isn't really from, as I say, suicide, trauma or these other reasons. Three factors were identified in the study, and as I say, this has been identified in most other studies and, and is very similar low socioeconomic status, adverse health behaviours, which obviously is what we're talking about today, and the potential for poor quality of medical care received by those with chronic mental health problems compared to those who don't have chronic mental health problems. That's an issue, and it's a very important issue, but I think that's one that we will deal with at another day in another context. So that the excess mortality is related to mental illness, not suicide or traumatic deaths. Okay? Smoking, as we know, is significantly more prevalent in people with mental illness than those without. And I say we've just got a number of statistics here. 21% um, of the general population in the United Kingdom are smokers. However, 40% of those identified with a mental health <coughs> diagnosis were identified as smokers. 64% of people with a probable psychosis have been identified as smokers. And there's a clear relationship between the amount of tobacco, incorrectly spelt there, um, smoking and the number of symptoms that people present. So there seems to be a clear relation with the severity of mental illness and the degree of smoking that is um, experienced. What's very interesting here on this study, and I, I don't know if there's any meaning to this statistic, but it, it, it's one of those figures that you, you see and you think, well, I'm going to have to write this one down, um, that 57% of parasuicides, so people who had attempted to take their own life within 12 months, were smokers. Okay? And that's compared, as I say, to 21% of the general population. Um, I don't think that smoking is causing parasuicide. I think it's more that smoking is related to severity of mental illness. The rate of smoking in Australia was um, among those is 32%, which was twice the national average from that particular paper, which shows that Australia's national average is quite low, thankfully. And in mental health admission state in, um, settings, 70% of patients admitted to mental health facilities were smokers, and 50% of them were identified as being heavy smokers. Okay? Estimated in the US that 44% um, of sorry, 42 of tobaccos used by mental... This, again, is quite a shocking statistic, really, that 44% of all tobacco use is used by those who have a diagnosis of a mental illness. Okay? In the US, they calculated that of the 440,000 annual deaths from tobacco-related illness, that 200,000 of them occurred with people with a diagnosis of a mental illness. Um, it's when you look at that statistic then that the statistic I showed at the very front makes sense. So why are people with mental illness dying earlier than those without? Well, if they're, you know, 20-odd percent of the population, but they're contributing almost 50% of the tobacco-related deaths, well, that's probably your causation found there. <coughs> Again, another very worrying statistic there was that the decline in smoking seen in the general population in the UK, inside this is the United States, 
between 2004 and 2011 was not seen in those with a mental health diagnosis. So that between 2004 and 2011, there was a significant decrease in smoking in the general population in the United States. However, among those with a mental health diagnosis, there wasn't a decline in smoking seen. Okay? And the conclusion from that paper was that this shows that tobacco control policies for the general population were not as effective in mental health populations. The question then would be, how are they penetrating into mental health populations rather than the effectiveness of it? Okay? So that, I suppose, is the, the, the start of the, the introduction, which is basically defining the problem. So smoking in mental health is a significant problem. People with mental health diagnosis smoke more commonly than those who don't have mental health diagnosis. And it's probable that smoking is a significant contributor to the fact that people with mental health diagnosis have a shorter life expectancy than those that don't. One of the things I think is often passed over, and this is a very busy slide, but there's only one bit of it that is of interest, of course, is smoking as a substance dependency. So we talk about people being substance dependent. If somebody is a heavy drinker, they are known as an alcoholic. If somebody is an opiate user or heroin user, there's numerous pejorative terms to describe them, which we won't use today. But we're used to people being described as addicts and being substance dependent. If we actually look at the ICD-10, which most of you know is the guideline or the diagnostic guide <coughs> for mental health disorder, interestingly down there in F17 is tobacco, which is defined as a substance dependent disorder. Patients come in and out of general hospitals, psychiatric, and I'm putting my hand up and saying that you know, it's, we do it as much as anybody else, but we don't diagnose them as dependent on tobacco. If somebody came in and they were drinking heavily, they'd come out with a dependency in alcohol as a diagnosis if somebody was using cannabis or opiate or any of the others, but we don't diagnose people with tobacco despite the fact that the international guidelines defines it as an addiction. It has to be said, I just nod at F15 and notice that caffeine is also in there. And that's something that's also is rarely identified. What is a dependency? So we come down to the symptoms of the substance dependency. How, what is, well, somebody is dependent on a substance, according to ICD-10, um, and thus according to the data that we are collecting, if they have any three or more of the following features over the past year. So a strong desire, sense of compulsion to take the substance, difficulties in controlling to taking the substance, they evidence a withdrawal state, if they evidence tolerance, so they're increasing the quantity that they're taking, if they have progressive neglect of alternate pleasures, and if they have a if they put their substance use as a primacy above other behaviours, or if they persist with using the substance despite the fact that they're aware that it's harmful. So in fact, actually, as you can see there, most smokers will f actually fall into that category and probably should be better classified as having a smoking dependency or a tobacco dependency disorder um, rather than the more friendly, less clinical term of smoking. Okay? This is just a slide from a paper in, published by David Nutt. Many, some of you may have heard of the gentleman. I won't push onto it very... Just who did a study to identify the harm caused by drugs within society. Um, and I just think it's important to illustrate this is not specifically among people with mental health, but as far as I'm aware, people with mental health weren't excluded from the study. It was just a general in society. And there's tobacco sitting number six on the list ahead of cannabis, benzos, ketamine. So I mean, if a friend of yours told you that they were taking a lot of ketamine, you'd probably bring him into a quiet room and try to explain to him to knock off the horse tranquilizers for a while. But if they're smoking it seemed to be more dangerous, so that's where we go, okay? So, there's a few myths about smoking in relation to mental health that I suppose we wanted to address today. The first point is that smoking can improve your mental health, and this is often said, and there's two, and there's numerous studies on this, I've just quoted two of them, that looked at surveys of people who smoke, why do you smoke? And the belief among regular smokers that smoking can be useful to alleviate stress symptoms. And actually, in studies of asking people, why do you smoke, the number one reason is, on any of the studies that I've read, has all shown smoking can relieve stress. Number two, interestingly, was, I enjoy it. Um, and then there's various different reasons further down. Okay? And then, as I say, the other paper just reinforces the first message. 
So is this true? Does smoking actually relieve stress? Is smoking able to um, lead to um, stabilization of one's emotions? Well, probable, in fact, that smoking relieves psychological disturbance that were probably produced by smoking itself. So on day one, the person first started, didn't start smoking because they were stressed. They started smoking because peer pressure, it was there, experimental, whatever is the reasons that people start smoking. Um, but actually that got them into a vicious cycle. There's a very interesting paper which looked at a, the side effects of tobacco uh, withdrawal or abstinence and showed that anger, anxiety, dysphoria, difficulty with concentration, impatience, insomnia, and restlessness are all valid withdrawal symptoms from nicotine. So the question is, people are saying, yes, smoking relieves my stress. And it does relieve your stress, but it's relieving a stress that's caused by the fact that you're in nicotine withdrawal and nicotine um, abstinence syndrome. So in fact, yes, you do feel better after smoking, but that's because you're actually just feeding your withdrawal state. Um, uh, these constipation, cough, dizziness, increased dreaming, and mouth ulcers were less loosely associated, but were also possible withdrawal symptoms from smoking. So if I said to you in the morning that I could give you a drug that would remove all of those feelings, you'd probably say, yeah, 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 yeah I'll take it. Um, but the point is, that's actually that drug that is giving him those feelings in the start. So that is one of the issues. So I say that's as I say, it's, I've kind of expl explicitly put that in the bottom point there, the theory that cigarettes don't improve psychological symptoms, but rather what they do is they treat the withdrawal symptoms that the cigarettes have actually included in the, f in the start. Now, within mental health settings, there is an element that there's a couple of things that this can lead to difficulty with. Fortunately, you know, the concept of the token economy that some of you will understand, where smoking was used as a way of rewarding positive behaviour, um, is fortunately not used anymore, um, but that would really have just reinforced the treatment of the withdrawal state. So it's putting somebody in a withdrawal state in order for them to do something that you want to positively do, and then you'd have treated the withdrawal state. One of the other difficulties that is mentioned in some of the research is in certain settings, if patients are on a regular routine of receiving a cigarette, so it's one cigarette every hour, one cigarette on the hour, one cigarette every two hours, or whatever, that in fact what you're doing is kind of Pavlovian style, you're, you're also reinforcing the withdrawal symptoms, that the withdrawals are actually getting into a timed um, routine. So in fact the withdrawals are being felt more acutely and they're, they're being relieved more acutely. All right, so that's one myth. So in fact, yes, smoking does make people feel better, but they only feel better because it was a smoking that made them feel worse in the first place. Depression, smoking, and smoking cessation. This was an excellent study. It was published this year. Um, now, it was done in a general practice setting, but is still relevant. Um, and this was a study where they looked at a number of people who had attended for smoking cessation and asked them, um, and patients with mental health disorder um, diagnosis, and asked them, why do you smoke? Okay, something probably that, as I say, is, is not often asked, probably. So, again, we find that low mood, anxiety, and stress were triggers to smoking. So I smoke when I feel down, I smoke when I feel stressed, the stress relieves my anxiety. Smoking gave them a control over part of their life. That they felt that with their mental health diagnosis, they had very little control of their life, they had very little to do, but at least with smoking, they had something that they could have control of. Um, <laughs> it gave them a strong association between, um, there was a strong association with people who reported being bored, having nothing to do during the day and smoking. So smoking was seen as an activity. So the ritual of smoking, the ritual of buying the cigarettes, having something to leave the house for, and those sort of things. Patients were ambivalent, so I, he had strong opinions on either side about how smoking helped their ongoing symptoms. Some people saying, yes, smoking helped my symptoms, and some people were aware that it didn't help their symptoms. And there was one chap um, who, well, it might have been a lady, actually, uh, I shouldn't be sexist, who said that one of the difficulties that he said was that he felt very guilty after smoking that he felt that the smoking did help him, his symptoms, but after he smoked, he felt guilty about it, which does kind of fit into that pattern that actually, really, it's treating the withdrawal phase. Some described smoking as a form of self-harm, interestingly. Some described a strong feeling of hopelessness about quitting. I've tried before, I'll never quit, and that kind of fitted into their depressive 
symptomatology and that their general hopelessness about life. And one of the conclusions from that study was that people with mental health problems who quit smoking probably need more psychological support than people who don't have mental health problems in trying to quit smoking. And specifically that the psychological support should be looking to address some of the reasons why the person is smoking. So I suppose the, the point of this study and slide is that smoking among people with mental health is a little bit more complex than it can be among those who don't have mental health diagnosis and that if you don't, in your smoking cessation, attempt to address some of those problems or the reasons why people are smoking, that your smoking cessation efforts will be less um, effective. One of the other myths is that people suffering from mental health problems don't want to quit or they can't quit. Okay, so smoking with mental health populations is just as interested as quitting as those in the general population. And then there's an interesting study that showed that 47% of psychiatric inpatients in Australia um, had made an attempt to quit smoking in the previous 12 months, which would kind of generally fit in with other numbers. Okay? The NICE guidelines would show that evidence-based smoking cessation interventions are effective for smokers, and the smokers with a mental disorder require additional monitoring, um, and we'll come to that in a second. All right. Um, okay, so we move on to the next bit. So I say we've defined the problem, we've defined that it is a diagnosable disorder, and now we've addressed some of the myths that people with mental health can quit, they want to quit, um, and that actually one of the difficulties with their quitting is that it's a withdrawal state from the cigarettes themselves. Okay, very interesting paper in the British Medical Journal this year, which looked at the effects on mental health of people who quit smoking. And this was an, a meta-analysis of a number of different papers. And they showed that quitting smoking, and that's the references at the bottom, showed a significant decrease in anxiety, mixed anxiety and depression, depression symptoms, decrease in stress, and an increase in psychological quality of life among people with a diagnosis of mental health problems who had quit smoking. So basically the person, if we put the, if we make a synthesis of the whole theory, the point is that they've been put out of the nicotine withdrawal cycles and in fact actually um, their mental state and their psychological well-being improves. This strength of association they found was similar for the general population as well as clinical populations and by that they mean people with a mental health diagnosis. Um, Meta-analysis the effect size and this was a very interesting part of the paper and they showed that the meta-analysis, so the effect size for an SSRI type antidepressant. Now, what are we talking about in effect size? An effect size would be if you use one of the screening tools to screen for depression that they would use in a study and you'd get a, let's just hypothesize for a numeric to make the numbers easy. So the screening tool gave you a score from one to 100 and anything under 40 was seen to be depressed. That the number of points on that tool that the SSRI antidepressant increased was equivalent to the number of points that stopping smoking <coughs> would increase people's mood. Okay? Now that doesn't mean that stopping smoking is a treatment for depression because obviously some people wouldn't be depressed at the time that they stopped smoking, but it means that it will improve people's mood to the same extent that an antidepressant. So the point would be that if you combine stopping smoking with adequate treatment for depression, as opposed to, I'm not arguing that it is a treatment, but in fact, actually, not only would you increase people's mood and hopefully get them out of a diagnosis of depression, but you'd also push them from being out of diagnosis of depression into a much higher state of psychological well-being. Okay? So the point of this paper is that it should reassure doctors treating patients with mental illness that cessation is unlikely to have negative effects, which comes back to that initial myth that people smoke to help their mental health, and that actually if we stop them smoking, their anxiety and stress level are going to go through the roof and then um, we're actually going to, going to make the situation worse, not better. Okay? General principles in treating smoking cessation in mental health. So this is just to outline a couple of general principles in treating smoking mental health. The first principle is actually is roughly the same as treating smoking cessation in the general population. Okay, that there is really, it's not reinventing the wheel, it's not um, providing a brand new methodology, it's roughly the same procedure, but that it needs to be maybe tweaked in a slightly different way. Notice that patients within mental health service may need support, especially one-to-one -one support. 
Um, and I think anybody who works in mental health are and are aware of, of, of people who have mental health difficulties, I mean, I think that point is kind of self-evident and could really be used for people with mental health do problems or serious mental health problems. It could really apply to almost any activity that they do, that they do tend to, by the nature of mental illness, require certain more support in doing most activities, um, specifically when initiating and starting activities than people who don't have mental health diagnosis. Okay. Um, they need to be aware of the effects of quitting smoking on medication and adjust doses necessary. And I'll come to this at the end, that actually smoking does have metabolic difficulties with uh, medication, not just psychotropic medication, but other medication. I say we'll come to that at the very end. And then it said the smoking cessation of mental health services needs a multi-pronged approach across a continuum of care. And again, that's basically re-emphasizing point two, that you know, it is about addressing, well, why are you smoking? And if somebody is smoking because they feel it gives them control over their life and that they have nothing else to do, and then actually, if you don't start looking at addressing those problems, I think that your attempts at smoking cessation are going to be less successful than they would be. Okay? And that, I think, is what they meant in that paper about the multi-pronged approach, and also that your smoking cessation effort will take maybe longer, and you might have to have slightly more input than you would have to do with somebody who doesn't have a mental health problem. But as I say, that is probably applicable to most interventions in this population. Effect, efficacy of initiation tobacco dependence treatment in an inpatient psychiatry. Yes, and this is a paper that was published in the American Journal of Public Health this actually last month. Um, and it was a randomized controlled trial. And this, I, I put this up as a specific paper, and there's numerous papers on this, but the reason I bring this up is that it was run in an acute locked psychiatric ward. So, uh, you know, the, the area where you would have said smoking cessation is probably not the priority here. Um, and that smoking cessation mental health should probably be for, you know, in community mm -hmm. settings rather than in the acute inpatient unit. However, this was a study used. They used motivational tobacco cessation treatment combined with nicotine replacement. Interestingly, in this study, they found that psychiatric measures did not predict abstinence. Measures of motivation and tobacco dependence did. So this actually slightly contradicts the, one of the previous slides I put up, where actually the, well, it doesn't really, to the extent that the previous slide said that the level of psychiatric illness predicted the degree of smoking, while this shows that actually the ability to achieve abstinence was more related to the person's smoking dependence and their motivation to quit, which is probably um, similar to the general population. Cessation treatment appeared to decrease the risk of rehospitalization, which I think is the most interesting part of the whole study. So people who quit smoking and remained abstinent were less likely to be re readmitted. Exactly why that is, they don't go into but it was a statistical finding that they found. Okay? Um, and did smoking cessation then provide a broader therapeutic benefit? As I say, I can't answer that question. Um, that's what they found. I say the paper was only released in August, so there's probably more discussion required on that topic. Um, okay, and we're almost at the end now. So smoking cessation mental health setting. The treatments, I haven't gone into this in any great detail, but I, mean, I feel that you know, this, this information is findable. Um, smoking, smoke, nicotine replacement therapy obviously being the number one and probably the main go-to medication. May require a combination of both the patch and the slower, longer-acting and the faster-acting versions. May require higher doses in those with mental health difficulties. Now, whether that's because of the mental health diagnosis or whether because of medication or whether because people with mental health difficulties, as we've already said, tend to smoke more and tend to be more ingrained smokers, again, it's hard to differentiate that out. Longer-term use of the nicotine replacement therapy was also found to be needed then in the general population. So they, in this study, they looked at it for three months and then one group they took for six months and another group they stopped at three months and in the group that they stopped after three months, they had 100% um, fell back into smoking. But in the group that stayed on the nicotine replacement for a further six months, so nine months in total, they had a much better response rate. Um, bupropion and varicelline 
again, there's papers out there to show that they are more effective than placebo in reducing smoking, but I won't, as I say, dwell on that. Okay, and I think this is my last slide. Um, now, what's very interesting about smoking, we keep talking about um, nicotine and nicotine replacement, but actually, in smoking, it's not the nicotine, but it's the other compounds within the cigarette smoke, in the tar as such, in the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, um, which are found in tobacco smoke, and they are seen to induce hepatic enzymes. Now, well, what does induce hepatic enzymes mean? Well, what that means is that when you take a medication, it goes into your bloodstream, and your liver enzymes, your hepatic enzymes, are the things that break that medication down and allow and clear it from your body. If you induce those enzymes, that means those enzymes work a little bit quicker. So when you take the medication into your system, the concentration of it drops quicker than it would have done if those enzymes were not being induced. Okay? That's a very simple explanation to those who, who may not have a background in pharmacology. Um, so the point is that if you're smoking, your medication is being broken down quicker. So the actual effective dose going around your bloodstream is less than it would be if you weren't smoking. Okay? It's interesting to point out that it is not the nicotine that does this. And the reason why it's important to point that out is that nicotine replacement therapy will not compensate this. That it is actually the hydrocarbons in the smoke that causes this effect rather than the nicotine. So, uh, so as I say, the nicotine replacement therapy isn't going to compensate for this. So even if somebody's on nicotine replacement therapy, you still have to be aware of the fact that it can reduce medication. Um, interestingly, smoking, and caffeine makes a final reappearance, um, can also do the same thing for caffeine. So possibly one of the reasons why people who smoke a lot drink a lot of coffee is the fact that actually the smoking is making the coffee less effective actually increasing its metabolism and its clearance from the body as well. So actually, if somebody stops smoking, the, their coffee, their effective caffeine level will, will increase. Okay? So I just have, I mean, again, there's buckets and buckets of papers on this. Um, most of them incomprehensible to me, but that's fine. Um, and when the patient stops smoking, I just took two examples. One specifically, clozapine, and if anybody's aware of clozapine, we know it's quite a toxic medication. And that, I suppose, is why I'm highlighting it there. And elanzapine, which is clozapine's chemical cousin, but um, not quite as toxic, but still not completely safe. Dosages may need to be reduced actually by the extent of 30 to 40 percent um, if people stop smoking, okay, because of the hepatic induction of the enzyme. So it's being metabolized out quicker. So, in fact, if you stop smoking, and again, that's the upper end limit. Most people, is it more 10 to 20 percent? The upper limit would be 30 to 40 percent. Okay. The list of how different medications are affected by smoking cessation are available online and in most medication handbooks that you'll find, or therapeutic handbooks that you'll find, or prescribing handbooks. And obviously, if you're do working smoking cessation on somebody on a lot of medication, it's possibly beneficial to inform their prescriber, especially if they're on psychotropic medications, that this person is in a smoking cessation, so the person is aware if any medication changes need to happen. The recommendations tend to be that one would not change medication, with the exception of clozapine, as I say, but that's kind of a slightly different medication because it has a higher degree of toxicity than most other medications. And if somebody's on clozapine, as people here know, people are getting weekly blood tests, and then they're on blood tests every month for the rest of their life. So it's, it's slightly different. But for most medications, the recommendations are not to front up change the medication dosage, is more to observe, and if the patient is suffering from side effects to the medic, or to expect that the person might suffer some side effects, and then to reduce the medication down the line, because not everybody has that effect. Conclusion. Um, smoking is a significant problem among those with mental health. We define that. Smoking cessation can actually have physical benefits, which we are all aware of, but also can have mental health benefits. Smoking cessation interventions are successful in mental health settings, as we showed from our randomized control trial in an acute ward. And there's a need for adequate staff training across all mental health settings. So community settings, day hospital, partial hospitalization, day centers, and as well as inpatient units to initiate smoking cessations. Because as we know with the mental health services, it has different levels of intensity 
and people come into the service at different points. Okay, and that yes, and then the final point, just that smoking cessation. If somebody is stopping smoking cessation, this may have a knock-on effect to their medication, and this just needs to be kept in mind. And specifically, say if people are on particular medications, um, there are the references list. Um, not complete because I ran out of energy at a certain point in time, but um, almost all of them are there. All right, so thank you very much.